I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Art Brunch, where, as you know, we explore the wisdom of the art, spirituality, and the great ideas. So let's just get rolling here. This topic is transcendent beauty. Uh, I thought we'd take a little bit of a break from uh, political discussion, but I did feel the political discussion was necessary. I know that some of you wanted to continue it, but we're going to take a little bit of break. I can always revisit it later. And I will actually refer to a couple of our thinkers that we had the last couple of weeks again. So um, I'm not completely abandoning it, just 95% abandoning it. So let's get rolling right off the bat here. <clears throat> At a place called Katza, Israel, it's in Northern Israel, Katza. Uh, the remains of several individuals, including this adult and child that you see on the left, uh, we, they happened to be modern humans, homo sapiens. They were found in a cave along with 71 pieces of red ochre and ochre-stained to stone tools. Now, the ochre was found near the bones, which suggested to the archaeologists that it was used in ritual. These grave sites, get this, date to around 100,000 years ago. So it shows evidence of proto-religious or religious belief dating that early. And on the right, some of you may recognize this as Chauvet Cave in Ardèche, France. It dates to 30,000 to 28,000 BCE, <clears throat> so about 32,000 years old. Most anthropologists believe many of the ancient cave paintings in Europe express religious concepts and reflect contact with spirit worlds, or at least belief in spirit worlds. Now, why am I showing evidence of art, ritual, and ideas of a religious or proto-religious nature? Well, according to most social psychologists, including our friend Jonathan Haidt, who we learned about last week, human beings are religious by nature. We are religious by nature. Been that way for at least 100,000 years. And human beings have an innate need to express religious sentiment through art. This is significant because we are living in a time when religions of any kind are denigrated. But even completely secular organizations and movements adopt a spirit of religious fervor. The new atheists are a prime example. Sometimes this religious fervor, however, destroys art instead of creating it. These two young ladies, as part of a Just Stop Oil protest, splash tomato soup onto a Van Gogh painting of sunflowers. Whenever an ideological movement, no matter how noble its principles, starts destroying beautiful things, it has become corrupted, grossly corrupted. In the eighth century, Emperor Leo III, known as the Isaurian, was leader of the Byzantine Empire. You can see his image on the coin on the left. He issued an edict to destroy all religious icons. I'm sure some church leaders agreed with Emperor Leo and thought works of such beauty might tempt the unsophisticated to worship the paintings and sculptures, in other words, commit idolatry. Well, I would argue the church leaders who believed this may have been a little short-sighted on this issue. Their thinking may have lacked the proper sophistication. Trying to simplify, listen to this, this is very careful, and it harkens back to what we learned uh, the last two weeks. Trying to simplify a complex reality, which is very left brain sort of thinking, often results in disastrous ideas and behaviors. Now, thankfully, a monk named John of Damascus, whom you see on the right, was around and who set the empire and the church back on its proper course, at least from my perspective, he did. But without John of Damascus, there would have been no Chartres Cathedral, none of the grand cathedrals full of incredible stained glass and artwork, none of it without his work. Now, unfortunately, we had unsophisticated views about art resurfaced later during the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe. 
all of the movements motivated by religious reform. Now, reform movements of any kind, they always begin with good motives. And so often they turn into fanaticism. Again, because they oversimplify. This is often the case with both the far left and the far right, always seeking absolute certainty by oversimplifying complex situations and people, becoming radicalized by putting people and ideas into sharply bordered categories, into thickly walled boxes. Now, as you can tell, let me go ahead and confess, I am biased towards what I refer to as the sensible center, which is both left of center and right of center versions. During the Renaissance, there were brief periods of where art was destroyed, most famously at the Bonfire of the Vanities. Maybe some of you have heard of it, led by the fanatic Dominican friar named Girolamo Savonarola. You see his profile on the left, and there he is preaching to a crowd. And at his feet, you can see works of art, luxury items getting ready to be burned. <clears throat> Despite all this, it is strange how religious sentiment has also inspired not only the earliest art, but much of the most beautiful art. Yet we still have people today who believe art doesn't belong in houses of worship or centers of spiritual development. And I went to school with some of these people. Do you remember this quote from last week? from Jordan Peterson, he's a psychologist from Toronto. He said, when you throw out a sophisticated religion, you get an unsophisticated religion to take its place. Remember, we can't get rid of our religious nature. We are religious by nature. We will take ideas we deem of the utmost significance and make them a religion. Communism bears all the traits of religion as much as white nationalism in our country bears the traits of religion. I think we therefore should not deny our religious natures, but need to choose our religiously infused ideas and perspectives wisely. Now it makes perfect sense that we should worship the highest values. The trick is to determine what those values should be. It's been said by many that we become what we worship. What do we worship? What values do we honor? Pay most of our attention to, spend most of our time and energy on. This is what we will become. The ancient Greeks worshiped gods whose ideals, I would say, were questionable, at least by our standards. Molestation of others was viewed as the right of the gods and thus the right of the powerful elites of society. Might made right in classical Greek and Roman culture. What if we instead look to that which is transcendent instead of perhaps ancient? Lust, money, pleasure, all values of classical Greek gods but if you think about it, these are all transient things, not transcendent values. But let me not assume anything. Let me ask you, are there values that you believe are universal, that never go out of style, so to speak, no matter what time period or geographical location? Do you believe certain values are universal? According to the 13th century scholastic Thomas Aquinas, some of you have heard of him, there are indeed transcendent values. Now, there's nothing more transcendent than being itself, you know, existence, being. But being expresses itself in three ways, according to Aquinas and those who followed his thinking. And here they are. They express, or it expresses itself through truth, through goodness, and through beauty. These three are also known as the three transcendentals. Now, the value of the good might sound maybe off-putting to some of us, because we recognize we hold different ideas of morality 
And certainly we don't want anyone imposing their ideas of the good onto us. And I think it's the same with truth. We don't like the idea of someone imposing their truth on us. And so when we hear absolute language around goodness and truth, well, we might kind of flex a little bit. It would be off-putting. But I don't believe we experience beautiful, the beautiful that way. If someone wants to share something beautiful with us, we usually don't say, keep your beauty to yourself, Buster. No. But instead, we typically say, sure, please share it with me. So I'm going to play it safe. And today, I'm going to focus on one transcendental, the beauty. Here's your Latin. Here's your Latin lesson, everybody. Thomas Aquinas said, beauty occurs at the intersection of, here are the words, integritas, consonatia, and claritas. Let's look at each of these three properties of the beautiful. Integritas, as, as you know, our word integrity comes from it. It means wholeness, completeness. We say an object with integritas hangs together as one. Have you or someone you know been at war with themselves, living with some inner conflict that you or they couldn't reconcile? Would you say the experience is a beautiful one? No, of course not. You were not in integritas. For some reason, this is coming to mind. I don't know if you know about the TV show Lucifer. Anybody heard of that one? Maybe it's still airing. It, it was uh, on a few years back. And Lucifer refers to that Lucifer, the fallen angel Lucifer. But the show is set in modern times. Now, Lucifer is an attractive person, of course, but far from being the father of lies, as he's often said of in religious tradition, this Lucifer tells the kind of truths everyone else is afraid to admit. He is charismatic, of course, and yet this Lucifer needs to attend therapy sessions. Why? Well, because he has father issues. He's been kicked out of heaven, of course. And despite his seeming confidence, really cockiness, he actually is self-loathing. In other words, he does not possess integritas. And we, the viewers, sense an internal conflict. Consonantia is the second aspect of beauty. It's a musical term. It meaning means to sound with, to sound with. It means to be in harmony, to hold the right symmetry, the right proportionality. It means that the dimensions of an object or a piece of music or even a poem should correspond to a metaphysical ideal. Let me ask you, have you ever heard a professional classical choir singing some great tune like Vivaldi's Gloria? When done well, we in the audience can literally believe angels are singing. Angels are singing right there in the auditorium or even the cathedral if we're there. That's consonatia. And finally, claritas, which means clarity, radiance, splendor. It's something that is eye-catching. Well, let's look at some works of beauty and reflect on them in light of these three aspects. The first images I'm going to show you are from the Western tradition, but not Europe. I'm going to start in the Americas and then kind of move out from there. So get ready to reflect on the images you see. I want to start on something less familiar to us. And so it may require a little reflective pause for adjustment. But still, keep in mind when you're looking at it, these three aspects. I'm going to show you a Mayan mural. Take a moment to look at it and see if you can sense a beauty in this work. And now we'll move on from this work to a similar themed work by a first-generation 
Mexican. It was known as New Spain then. It's from the work of Balthazar de Echevea Ibia, The Immaculate Conception. Evaluate its beauty in light of integritas and consonatio and claritas. Now let's enter a couple of buildings of beauty. The Metropolitan Cathedral of Rio de Janeiro. Imagine yourself in this space. What would you be experiencing? What about this space? This is the interior of, uh, I think it's Brasilia Cathedral in Brazil. Built in 1970, much more modern. Take a moment to imagine yourself in this space, underneath these dangling angels. What would you be experiencing? Or perhaps in this more traditional cathedral in Ottawa, Canada. Now we will eventually get to the beauty of our European tradition, but let's first go east more specifically to Japan. This is the great wave off of Kanagawa by Hakusai. Very famous painting, probably the most famous Japanese painting in existence. Take a moment with it. It's different from maybe the styles we're used to, but can you see the beauty in it? Or how about this work, Autumn Leaves? Now let's go outside to a Japanese Zen garden. What makes such a place beautiful to you? All right, now let's go to the beautiful creations of Europe. Integritas, Consonatia, and Claritas. How about this very famous work? Well, 
or the classic works of Michelangelo. For this work, what experience are you having when you look upon something like this? Or a work like this? Or this by Klimt. After viewing all of the works and cathedrals and gardens that you've just looked at, examine your heart and your soul for a moment. Can such images really communicate that beauty is subjective? Is that what you're experiencing? Or do you believe, at least in your gut, that there are certain things that are beautiful and they are objectively beautiful? Now I'm going to take a radical shift. Let's look at art inspired by a different set of values than what we just looked at, not by beauty. These are portraits of the artist's mother by Alberto Giacometti. And most of you know Giacometti as a sculptor. So these images might surprise you. He completed these in the 50s and 60s. He didn't flatter his mother, did he? Rather ugly, I'd say. What do you think of Bird's Hell by Max Beckman, completed in 1938? A German artist, 1938, that should give you some context. I think many artists during the middle of the 20th century felt it was inappropriate to depict the beautiful, and the political reality was as ugly as it could be. Aren't artists supposed to depict the zeitgeist, the spirit of their age, even if that spirit is far from beautiful? This artwork was also done in the nihilistic aftermath of World War II. It's Pope Innocent X after Velasquez by the artist Francis Bacon. Why create art like this? Well, they obviously reflect, reflect 20th century views of, of modernism and existentialism, which often expressed ideas that modern life was increasingly empty and devoid of meaning. 20th century Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar said, Quote, we live in a period when things are deprived of the splendor reflected from eternity. Let me read that again. We live in a period, and he was writing in the middle of the 20th century, we live in a period when things are deprived of the splendor reflected from eternity. But remember that one of the attributes of significant art, notice I didn't say beautiful art, I said significant art, is that it reflects the time in which it was created. So such works as Giacometti's or Beckman's or Bacon's reflect back the loss of meaning Europe experienced in the aftermath of a growing atheism and sense of meaninglessness during the middle of the 20th century. Such works may be ugly, undeniably so really, but they can also be prophetic, pointing out an ugliness that needs to change. Let me ask you this, can real change be brought about 
without a simultaneous turn, turning back to the beautiful. Take a look at this incredible cathedral in Quebec City. It's the Notre Dame Basilica in that city. Let me ask you this. Why do secular people, secular people, not religious people, love to enter the great cathedrals? Well, I think the answer is obvious to all of us, because they encounter in such places a beauty that surpasses understanding that reflects the transcendent, the ineffable sublime. This is the North Rose window at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Many a person has stated that they've converted to the Catholic faith by gazing on this window. And when we ourselves experience such beauty as this and everything else that we've seen, do we honestly believe we are having a completely subjective experience? Don't we have a strong intuition that the beautiful, drawing our eyes and indeed our souls and our spirits as well, is reflecting a truth, a reality that is, dare I say it, irrefutable? Isn't that what we actually feel inside? Here's another view of the window. Can you imagine hearing Johann Sebastian Bach's Magnificat in such a place? Think about that for a moment, imagine it. As you may know, the French are a very secular people, but they will flock to hear Bach music in one of their many cathedrals. Now, why on earth would they do such a thing? A typical French person may answer saying, I don't believe in God, but I'm here at this cathedral to experience God. Here's a powerful truth I learned from the Catholic tradition, from the gentleman actually that I quoted earlier, Balthazar. He said, we don't grasp beauty. We don't observe something like this work by Thomas Moran and then ponder it a while and then recognize qualities that we then add up to beauty. Now, beauty seizes us. There is an immediacy to it. We don't think our way to it. One of the most Influential teachings on beauty in the entire Western tradition is, was given by a Greek priestess from ancient times. You may recall my mentioning Diatima a few weeks ago. She was instructing Socrates on the nature of beauty and how if we contemplate the beauty we see on earth, say in a beautiful body, we are eventually led to contemplate the highest form of beauty, which exists in a different realm. Heaven, even, if you are comfortable with me using that term. She said to Socrates, suppose you gaze on a beautiful person. If you spend time with that experience of admiration, you will soon realize that there are many beautiful people around, from the one to the many. Then you will begin to think about which of them also possesses a beautiful soul and a beautiful character, who then may create beautiful laws and institutions. And reflecting on that more, we will think of the beauty found in nature and its laws, and all the beauty in certain kinds of knowledge. And then pretty soon, we are thinking of the beauty of the very source of such noble characters and laws and knowledge. Here are the famed maroon bells near Aspen, Colorado. Some of you have had the good fortune to see them in person. Going back to our friend Balthazar, he said, beauty first arrests us. It stops us in our tracks. Then beauty elects us. As if it were saying, I grace you, I bless you with this vision. And then beauty sends us. 
In other words, it has an evangelistic spirit to it because we can't help but tell many people about the experience of beauty. In other words, beauty by its very nature is religious. It is why beauty is a core principle of healthy religion and spiritual paths. When any religion denigrates the beautiful or simply minimizes its importance, it ceases, in my eyes, to be truly religious in the best sense of the word. And instead, it becomes an ideology, which may eventually spew a cold absolutism and life-denigrating certainties, which many reform movements have done. So at various times, like the middle of the 20th century, we lose our sense of the beautiful. At least we definitely have in the West. But let's acknowledge that maybe art like this work by Max Beckman has a prophetic role to play. But we should never forget that even in such ugly times as the rise of totalitarianism and fascism, we as a culture still need to engage in the beautiful, if not to survive such times, to remind us to reject the ugliness in our politics and tribalism and treatment of one another. We can't have only the expression of the ugly. In other words, we must also engage the beautiful. Witnessing all this, the theologian Balthazar called us to follow the teaching of Diotima, seeking out the beauty and allowing beauty to always move us to a higher spiritual state. He said, we no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make of it a mere appearance in order the more easily to dispose of it. He, of course, was talking about the 20th century. I wonder if artists like Beckman really had lost their hope in the reality of beauty. If so, it's a shame. I will close with a painting that I happen to find very beautiful. This work showing St. Francis gazing upward is by Giovanni Bellini. It captures well how all forms of beauty in this material world should elevate our thoughts to higher forms of beauty, including the beauty of goodness and truth itself, the beauty of unconditional love, the beauty of simplicity and contemplation, the beauty of our source, the great artist. But well, where do you go to find beauty? And what intuitions about reality do you have, including ultimate things, when seeing beauty? Those are the two questions I want us to engage with. Let me allow you to unmute yourselves. Where do you go to find beauty? That's the first question. And what intuitions about reality ultimate reality do you have when seeing beauty?